Last time we were together in. next uh, after this session right here. We're very, very happy to have uh, our, our partners in this uh, in this day, in this event today, ProMexico, moderating this next panel. And so Flavio Diaz Miron Alvarez will, will be moderator, and I'll just pass it to you right now. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Eh, buenos días a todos. Eh, su servidor, eh, represento a ProMexico en Estados Unidos y Canadá. Tengo el placer de estar eh, con mis compañeros Agustín Barrios Gómez, eh, Alfredo Hinojosa, Iván, Jaime, que nos visita de San Antonio, beautiful San Antonio, Texas. Y, uh, welcome to you all. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, diputado, can we sustain this in English? If, yeah, of if, you, if you agree. We can do then, it in German if you want. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can do it in the, Swedish, the, 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 No, the, the French, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, welcome to you all. Uh, as uh, you know, this. This time, uh, we, uh, the concept of envisioning a competitive U.S. border uh, triggers a lot of questions to those that, we, uh, that have been doing business uh, between Mexico and the States for so many, many years. I remember when we set up a company in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Ch Chihuahua for a, a motor company in which we uh, set up an engine facility uh, the problem we had then is that when we exported the engines back to the States, we had the Army ex ins uh, inspecting the, the, the uh, railroad, and the Army didn't know, but they were stepping up, you know, on the engines, and they were breaking some parts of the engines, but they didn't know. Those days were very difficult days in which we had to, uh, basically, to teach how to inspect. That happened in our crossing from Chihuahua, uh, then we send them through, the, through, uh, through El Paso. So uh, we are here to talk about the majesty uh, of, of all the activities, which is the trade. And uh, the exchange of goods, com commerce, has been made a thing that we, uh, between the States, uh, Canada and Mexico, have been doing for a long, long time. Remember, going back to the automotive industry, exporting engines from or cars from the States to Canada through the Ambassador Bridge up in Detroit. 
and it was very beautiful then, 25 years ago. Today, if you go to the Ambassador Bridge, it, is, it so happened that it is less effective to use it than it was 20 years ago. So it seems like in some areas we, have, we are going a little bit backwards. So we are questioning ourselves how we should make things easier for those that are involved in trade, that are involved in industry, and that at the end of the day are benefiting the, cons the, the consumers. The other day, I was talking to a person that, had, uh, that has this business of, uh, of uh, m uh, making, uh, manufacturing uh, curtains that uh, you call Home Depot, and then when you go to Home Depot, you size your window, and then you order this window uh, through a telephone number nationwide, and that telephone number immediately connects you to a facility in Reynosa, and then the Reynosa guys takes that order, makes that uh, shade, makes it in a day, puts it back into, uh, in, into, into the career, international career, and sends it back to the States. And in two years and a half, in two days and a half, the curtain is in the home of the person that requested that order in Home Depot. So that sort of thing is what we are really going to be seeing in the future, and more so when we uh, when we will at the end be entering into what we what I call a customized era. Things will be following the personality of the buyers. The buyers will now request cars with special colors, with special sizes, will require things with special qualities. And that flexibility, it's only made through nearness. Mexican manufacturing presence provides flexibility because it is also near. And that is nothing we can do about it, but we can do something there benefit. So the, the, the subject of the conversation is how we can make things easier, faster, and in infrastructure so that we can provide means to the consumers, to the people involved in trade, so that trade can be easier and the consumer can pay, you know, in the future, lesser cost for inefficiencies that we, because of our lack of management, create. So with this in, in mind, I will turn first uh, uh, the, the, the floor to Agustin for, uh, for, for just to hear what is his view on what is going on, how can we improve in that uh, subject, which is the infrastructure, how can we help trade uh, happen in far better and faster terms. Thank you very much, Flavio. Este, um, I'm going to be talking about the political aspects of of of, of all of this of border policy. Um, I want to thank uh, Duncan for 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 holding these. How can how can we help? Um, I think the starting point is more and more of these uh, types of of, of get-togethers. These are fundamental um, for 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 getting the word out, for getting people to really understand what's going on. Um, uh, I want to say hi to uh, my fellow congressman Murguia. And uh, to Manuel Suarez Mier, who uh, it's been a while I haven't seen. He was professor at Georgetown when I was here, so it's great to see him from American University. So when I discussed the possibility of participating in this panel, I told Chris that uh, perhaps it might be a little too technical for my area of expertise. But as I continued to think about it, it occurred to me that if there is one aspect that is keeping the border from achieving its full potential, it's uh, the political situation, and that it's high time that we did something about it. And I'm not going to throw around statistics that you've probably already heard um, and, and, of course, the anecdotal horror stories that highlight just how profound is the ignorance um, that shapes attitudes and policy in both Mexico City and Washington, D.C. I know that here, at least, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. But what I do want to highlight is that having people believe in all three North American countries that something like NAFTA is a boon for some business elite in another country, that is, that Canadians think that Americans benefit to their cost, that Americans think that Mexican ben Mexicans benefit more to their cost, that Mexicans think that Americans benefit more to our cost. And it's not only silly, it's dangerous. So we've got tens of millions of ordinary people in all three countries, depending on the more than one trillion dollars in trade that goes through our borders. And yet we allow this discussion to be hostage to ignorant grandstanding without our calling the opportunists and the xenophobes out. 
Instead, those of us who know and those of us who care are reduced to lamenting the situation and the problem goes on and the problem grows. And notice that I'm not talking about that other political whipping boy that is immigration. Here I'm just referring to the much more simple, much more obviously win-win area of economic growth and regional development that is trade and border infrastructure. Uh, a no-brainer, if there ever was one. But even amongst those in the know, there are a lot of people who don't. Um, also, the business, social, and political communities along the border tend to be very parochial, curiously enough. So people in Brownsville, Matamoros, are ignorant of the situation in El Paso Juarez, who know very little of Nogales, Nogales, let alone um, uh, San Diego, Tijuana. No? And this despite the fact that the fate of each border crossing is tied on the national and binational stage to the fate of the other 330 ports of, uh, points of entry. So that's 330 and 45 different border crossings. And by the way, the fact that we don't have that vital statistic uh, about the most cross border in the world is symptomatic. The fact that we don't have it on the tip of our tongues is symptomatic of the, of, 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 of the, of the very strong need to disseminate this very basic information. So if we're going to be politically effective, the, thing, the first thing that we need to do is we need to standardize and we need to disseminate a common narrative. The converted um, uh, that I mentioned earlier, the people who go to the Wilson Center talks, uh, who join the BTA, who participate in NASCO, who get it, quote unquote, um, all of us need to know what we need to know to make our case. And it's all about creating a constituency. All of those people who are involved in politics, like I am, understand the need to create a constituency that can mobilize in favor of that vital, precious, and fundamentally misunderstood piece of binational real estate that is our border. And we need to be intelligent about it because it has to have depth. So each and every one of those tens of millions of Americans and Mexicans and even Canadians whose jobs depend directly on the trade that happens along our border knows that their livelihood will tank if we do not make sure that the border works every day. We need them to react just as viscerally as the know-nothing fringe to anti-border legislation. We also need to create a constituency of political leaders who are kept up to date about the issues that affect our border region. They not only need to react, but they need to know how to react to threats and even, and even to missed opportunities. And that is a job for organizations like this one. But it's not just about conjuring up great information and analysis, which actually already happens, thankfully but rather about establ establishing a common ground with all of the re relevant institutions transversely. In other words, we need Wilson to confer with the Center for U.S.-Mexico Studies at UCSD. We need the BTA to collaborate with NASCO. We need the Asociación de Empresarios Mexicanos and the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations to be in sync on these issues. We all need to be speaking with one voice. And this need for a common narrative necessitates using a common vocabulary and common statistics. And our, our, on our end, I just created a pamphlet, this pamphlet, which is a glossary of terms on the bilateral relationship that I'm publishing. And I, I invite all of us to create s similar documents within our areas of specialty based on a consensus that we all need to make reference to before we talk about something as important as our common border. Curiously, thankfully, Every single day, our executive branch institutions, both in Mexico and the United States, collaborate in millions of ways to make the border work. When Assistant Secretary Alan Burson, uh, Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security, talked to a group of us at the Mexican Congress a couple of weeks ago, he highlighted the fact that the U.S. and Mexican authorities are working together in ways that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. They're doing so because the fact that they are on the front lines is forcing them to adapt. History has sort of happened to North America, and we're always playing catch up. We need to, st we need to go from reactive to proactive. Um, because this is, I mean, these are real opportunities. This, it, these are areas of, as, as, as you might know, the, 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 the border regions on both sides are growing faster than the national average. So what does that mean? And they're growing in many, in many cases in spite of policy, not because of policy. What, so what does that mean? That means that there's a massive effective demand um, for, I mean, that's, that's growth that happens immediately. That's not places, you know, that's, that's not stuff that you need to subsidize. That's stuff that you invest and that you have the return on investment very visibly and, and in a very short, and in a very short period of time. In the capital and in San Lazaro, in the Camera de Diputados, 
in Los Pinos and in the White House, it's all too easy to let this history keep happening to the border. Uh, to let the integration process, which is such a massive continental fait accompli, speaking <laughs> French, um, or done deal, um, <laughs> that I, that today our countries have, for all practical purposes, integrated. And that's something that both our capitals really need to understand. Because if they don't understand it, they're going to be like in 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 a question of of of. of seconds they're going to be affecting millions of people that they don't even know how they're going to be affecting them and to let and we need to let that and, and right now that integration is taking place without our help and it's doing so haphazardly so very con concretely um, in in order so that you all as interested parties can be can be can be informed about certain things um, uh, that that we're trying to do um, in our 62nd legislature in Mexico, um, we have a lot of very, very, very worthwhile um, compañeras y compañeros, no? uh, diputadas y diputados. And um, we are proposing the com in, the for in our Foreign Relations Committee that we start doing bilateral parliamentary um, uh, reunions, that is, uh, uh, congressmen and women from both sides of the border getting together. And um, I'm very happy to report that uh, uh, Congressman O'Rourke, Congressman uh, Cuellar, um, uh, yesterday, um, uh, and, and now Filomón, we're very open to this idea. And so we should be having, by, before the end of the year, that. So we know our natural constituencies in, in each one of our Congresses for, for, uh, for uh, border infrastructure projects and border investment projects, and, and, and in terms of legislation that has to do with the movement of goods and, uh, and, and people. And so um, there's one last thing. That that occurred to me this morning, and 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 it's something that I, that I like to highlight when when I'm in Washington D.C. Um, just to, to to round it off and to finish. Um, I am very comfortable sp speaking in 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 favor of Mexico's interests in the United States um, because, for the moment, what's in the interest of Mexico is automatically in the interest of the United States. That's something that's that's that, that's actually a great luxury for people who speak for a living. Um, we have no hidden agenda, which is really phenomenal when you think about it. I mean, in in the world in this day and age, when you've got a China and a Russia, and all of these people, you know, vying for 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 for, for power and 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 always thinking of the world in a zero sum game, <laughs> in, 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 as a zero sum game, and always with a hidden agenda, and then coming and 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 and, and sneaking up behind you and and and, and uh, you know espionage and for for your companies and all of that as state policy, which we all know happens in, in many countries around the world vis-a-vis -vis the United States. There's none of that in Mexico. Uh, Mexico, in, in, at this point in time, our national interest is perfectly tied to U.S. national interest. And, for a, and given that it's a country of 120 million people and the world's 11th or 13th largest economy, that's no small feat. That's really no small feat. And uh, so I, I wanted to leave you with this idea that, we, that you have all of this amazing raw material and all of these incredibly high quality people, all of these great minds thinking about these issues, and all of this massive amount of capital that is, that, that is, that is invested um, in all of these areas along our common border and, and, and foreign investment of Mexican companies in the United States and of American companies in Mexico, beyond the demographic, the incredible demographic shifts that have gone on, and not just the 34 million Mexicans and Mexican Americans in the United States, but also the between one and three million Americans in Mexico at any given time. That's, by the way, between four and 12 times greater than the second place Canada. So you've got all of these, all of these interests, and they're there, and they are aligned, but it just still requires a lot of collaboration on our behalf on every one of our levels. And so with that, I leave the floor. Thank you very, very much, Agustin. It's, uh, it's important to always recognize that uh, the, you know, speaking the same language, having the alignment of thoughts it's important because we are all working on the same path. Sure. Uh, the, 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 indeed, as I said to you, uh, there you uh, to you all three, uh, there you go. Uh, the political side of the efforts that you make, uh, uh, you make a competitive border, is always a, a pillar of the final outcome. 
So the work you guys make in the Congress is what we really, at the end of the day, uh, are using as, uh, as a raw material for our working. So with political consensus, we can certainly build a similar border administration that can lead to the region towards a global leadership in competitiveness. I think that there is no doubt that we believe, I think that there is uh, enough momentum here in the States, in Mexico, Canada, that if we all work together towards the same direction, we will build a very strong region. Now, let's put our minds to work on that same direction. Do not only uh, work on the seamlessness of the administration of the border, but let's work on how we do it that effectively. So I turn uh, the mic uh, to you, Alex. Uh, Alex uh, is uh, the Deputy General Manager for the North American Bank, the, the, the NAD Bank, the, the, an institution that was created with the creation of the NAFTA. And uh, it was triggered those days to cover a little piece of the equation then thought that was important, that was environment, but now it has a far broader scope of work. So with this, uh, uh, and with the fact that we are in Mexico, say, uh, introducing our national program for infrastructure, let's see how we tie those programs with your, uh, pro uh, f uh, pro with your proposal and, uh, and see how we can uh, construct uh, as, as, as a proposal coming out of, of, of this presentation of yours. Thank you, Flavio. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Sorry for running around here. I needed to get this. Uh, my name is Alexi Hosai, and I am the Deputy Managing Director of the North American Development Bank. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to be up here since I have a, a, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. The, uh, the discussions have talked about planning and, and, and dreaming about uh, and, and envisioning a competitive uh, uh, U.S.-Mexico border. Um, uh, for those of you, uh, a lot of people dream about living on the border, and, and we get to do it. <laughs> we're a bank, and that's something that is quite uh, unique in that uh, we, we get to work with so many companies that are at the grassroots level, so many companies that are actually doing their little bit, little by little. Uh, but at the same time, we're a development bank, so we are actually working with the strategies of the, of the federal governments, both governments. Uh, and, and one thing you mentioned, Flavio, is we uh, are quite proud of keeping our environmental role. Uh, that is uh, to say that the infrastructure that we build has an environmental benefit, and that's important. I'm going to talk a little bit about update on the projects that we're doing, a little bit of our uh, port of entry study that we're doing, and then the future of, of the NetBank. I am proud to say that after 20 years uh, of operation, the NAD Bank has become a bank and that we are having a tremendous uh, impact on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, in 2013, our uh, results include uh, 19 new projects that were certified by the Border Environment Cooperative Commission, including drinking water, uh, wastewater, storm drainage, uh, uh, huge paving projects, uh, and, and then basic urban infrastructure. We've done seven solar energy projects, one wind energy, and one landfill gas to energy. The, the, these are all innovative things to, to be on the forefront with renewable energy, uh, using uh, methane capture, landfill gas, all these things. Uh, uh, it, it's a, as a banker, and I was an investment banker long before I was named to the uh, North American Development Bank, it, it's fun to work on project finance because you were working at the highest level, you're working in a co uh, cooperation between the private sector and the public sector uh, on, on things that benefit uh, our communities. Um, we uh, financed about $350, $360 million in uh, financing uh, and, and gave about $9.8 million in grants uh, for water and wastewater projects because what we do still work with a lot of small communities that really don't have financing capacity and are um, grant reliant. Here's a chart that I'd like to show that shows uh, our annual financing activity. And, and you can see that basically up until like about 2009, we were doing mostly grant administration. Uh, and that was necessary. And I have to say, I'm proud to say that standing on the shoulders of those that came before me, we transformed the services of the basic services, water, wastewater, landfill in the border region. On both the Mexican side and the U.S. side, we are at almost at the same level, 90, high 90 percentile of water service, 
uh, high 80 percentile in wastewater service, which is a huge difference to uh, southern Mexico, let's say. Additionally, I'd like to point out something that uh, I'll come back to. Our numbers there in, in, about, in um, 2011, when I was named, we were about 65% in our debt to the total project. That's what we were lending. Um, and we've slowly come down to lower and lower tickets, or meaning the percentage that we lend to the total cost of, of projects. What we have in the pipeline right now is actually under 20% meaning that we are leveraging outside dollars to come in because we're running out of money, uh, but we have to make the dollars stretch out. The good thing is that uh, the, the commercial community, the banks, uh, the communities that are uh, doing the sponsors for the projects, they want us there because they know uh, the benefit of the NADBank and the BEC in developing projects. Um, so uh, it, we, we still see a huge growth uh, for us as we go forward, um, and, and uh, along with the loans that, that we do, we've done uh, a lot of um, technical assistance to the communities. We have a program that uh, the trains and gives uh, a 12-day, three-course, uh, four-course, uh, uh, small MBA in, in, in uh, municipal management and utility management. This is very needed <clears throat> along the border because a lot of the communities don't have those capacities. But through our EPA funded uh, programs, uh, we've, we've uh, done some 44.9 million to com about 72 communities in Mexico and 93 in the United States. Technical assistance to date is about 55 million. Uh, this is something important. You know, those of us who live in the South Texas have seen the Eagle Ford Shale boom and what it's done to uh, infrastructure. The, South of Texas was had good streets, roads, highways, had good water systems, had good uh, housing, but when Eagle Forge, uh, the shale boom hit, they are quickly uh, outpaced, and what we are seeing now are uh, communities that are being stressed to provide services. I say that because in our uh, capacity building and training on the Mexican side, this is critical. If the continuation occurs into Mexico with the energy reforms for, for the shale oil, get ready. And so what we're doing right now is that in our training, we are telling people, let's stretch out the planning. Let's stretch out, you know, you, 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 we can provide the financial assistance for water, roads, uh, wastewater, landfills, et cetera, but you need to do the planning to get that, uh, to get ahead of the game because if it's coming, as I say, get ready. Cumulative financing. So we've done uh, about $2.4 billion worth of financing over 194 projects. Um, and uh, the projects that we've done, you know, a, a lot of them, uh, same topics, water, wastewater, landfills, uh, uh, a lot of homes with first time. Um, in fact, what we focused on was first time service for water and wastewater. The next topic that I'd like to throw out there in that we need to get prepared for is aging infrastructure. Yeah, believe it or not, you know, even though we were doing, spending huge amounts of, of money in getting the water and, and wastewater uh, systems in place, the central parts of the cities of Laredo, Matamoros, uh, Nuevo Laredo, um, are also starting to see uh, some major problems with aging infrastructure in the, in the central areas where you have uh, wastewater line cave-ins because uh, uh, the line doesn't exist anymore either because of sulfuric acids and, and other things that eaten, have eaten away the lines. So that's the next, the next phase. Um, and it's one of those things, you know, that it, it's a continuous uh, need to continue to in, invest in, in, in infrastructure. Project outcomes, uh, I won't get into too much of that, but, you know, Again, landfills, and uh, we've done one thing I feel very, very proud of is about a gigawatt of, mega, of, uh, of new solar and wind capacity. Uh, we've, we've invested um, heavily in making sure that we have a, a good project finance in doing that. Uh, and we uh, started on the United States side. Now we're into Mexico. We've done some of the first big utility scale wind projects uh, outside of Oaxaca in, uh, in the the state of uh, Tamaulipas. 
Okay, what else is going on? <clears throat> As part of the U.S. high-level economic dialogue, um, the, uh, certain things were brought to, to us uh, to do. And one of the subpillars of that was recognizing the importance of making an effective use of the NAD Bank. I mean, we are a tool. Uh, we are a, uh, a, 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 a coordinating uh, binational organization that when you look at uh, the entities, the number of entities that can actually function with the capacities that we have, I mean, there are a few. Uh, our response is that we're going to support, uh, uh, we're going to have definitely the support of the two governments in the area of ports of entry, and, uh, and, and in, in specifically, that was an area that, was, that was, uh, we were called upon to act upon and, and part of this discussion. And we were, but one of the things we need is um, in, in this high-level economic dialogue, uh, it was called, uh, two governments were called to assess our capital requirements because they, they understand that we've done our job, we've lent out money, well, we need to be replenished. So within the, the context of uh, the high-level economic dialogue, uh, the Beck nad Bank Board adopted a resolution back in November uh, and directed the bank to do this port of entry study. So what are we doing there? We are um, we're going to map out and identify all the uh, ports of entry. And this is those that are in the planning stage, those that are being expanded, those that are being remodeled, refurbished, et cetera. And, and it includes everything pedestrian, light vehicle, uh, rail, uh, commercial, <laughs> and that's critical. Now, mapping means a couple of different things. One is getting to make sure that we understand how they all fit within the region, but at the same time, it means looking at the processes, the process for approvement of presidential permits, of, of uh, moving these things forward um, is, is critical. So we are uh, starting really from the basis of what the regional uh, uh, um, the regional groups have done. They have d d invested significant amount of money and time in studying what the needs are in each of the regions. And from there, we are going to take off and look at now how do you get them. They, they define the need. We now figure out how do you get them done. Um, we are uh, certainly not in the in the mindset that we're going to prioritize any of these projects. That's not our, our goal. Uh, we are um, going to be, again, <clears throat> a tool in making these things happen. We're going to gather as much information uh, on that's out there. We don't want to do research, additional research that develops additional information. That's already been done. Now it's a matter of coordinating it and getting it uh, to work. We're going to uh, look at the financing mechanisms that uh, might be out there as a bank. You know, we, we work on, you know, structuring of all types. Um, but we want to see, um, using the laws that exist within the, the, I guess, new laws even in the United States on financing the infrastructure as well as the operation, that uh, those ideas are, are going to come and we're going to uh, get, get them published and, and that'll be part of our results. We're also going to try to set up an IT system that uh, will define, uh, well, that will give information for ongoing um, decision making. This is information that will be shared by the agencies on both, by uh, both countries, and we will um, uh, make sure that it, it stays up to date. So what we've done up to now is we've, um, we've, uh, we've uh, hired the uh, consultants, or we, we've hired consultants to help us write an RFP, and we've received the proposals, um, and uh, we will hopefully get that contract out. The final note is we need capital uh, funds. You know, we we've, we've basically have used up, uh, we could continue, because what we do is we go out in the open markets, we issue bonds, but we need to have the backing of the U.S. government and the Mexican government to continue to do that. So uh, with the help of our board, Treasury is, uh, uh, has, and the Mexican government, they've uh, started that process for us, uh, and we think uh, it'll be successful. Um, I thank you for listening, and it was a pleasure. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much.
think, well, I guess that uh, seeking money, you know, raising funds is uh, it's a, it's a big issue. But you do have here uh, <laughs> deputados, you have uh, l uh, local congressmen, you have so he's going to be more so effective. He's a PRI person, <laughs> he's a, a PRD person. So uh, you have a, a good constituency there to hear you uh, from the Mexican side. You know, smart borders is uh, something that uh, will, if we ever get to that uh, level, will make us be uh, the, a powerhouse as a region. You know, uh, crossing the border, uh, 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 crossing the border without any any time spent on uh, any red tape, it's the dream of exporters. We, uh, when we set up uh, an airspace facility in Mexico uh, some years ago, we thought that we were going to make uh, the level. You know, if we only counted the physical and the real time that the trucks make uh, made to take uh, uh, you know products from Mexico, say from Querétaro to uh, Montreal, uh, was going to take us say uh, seven days. Pon well, say uh, seven days and a half. The reality was at the, be at the beginning was 35 days, and then it, it, it was 25, and then it was 20, it was 19, and we are in the 18 days. Well, that is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, development. Now, uh, the smart border, as it is, is represents our ability as a society not to use the best-in-class smart border in North America is directly linked to the, and I'm sorry to say, inability of the leaders, to the leadership, toward a strong region where business crossing should not take longer than it actually takes. There is technology enough to check you out without any stopping nowadays. So uh, the technology is there. And I cannot think of a better, uh, a better company or a better uh, business that has been in the moving of, uh, of uh, merchandise since inception than Union Pacific. Quoting uh, ambassadors uh, Eduardo Medina Mora, uh, la last Sunday we had a dinner, and he said the most attractive region in the world looking forward is not obviously Asia anymore. It is here. It is us. Now, after hearing these remarks and listening to what is coming, because not only co is coming what we already have, is not only coming what is the direct effect of the structural reforms we are having in Mexico, but also what is coming is the nearshoring. Coming, you know, businesses coming out of China to be placed here in this region in the world that will uh, flood, so to speak, our ability, at least in Mexico, from the infrastructure point of view, that we need to be prepared. And infrastructure, I mean regulatory infrastructure. I mean physical infrastructure. And I also mean p persons infrastructure, in other, in other words, educational uh, infrastructure. So I leave the floor uh, to Ivan, who is the public general uh, director of, uh, uh, public relations general director, sorry, of Union Pacific. And as I said, I cannot think of another business, uh, better business uh, in, the tri in the moving of things than your business. So the floor is yours, uh, Ivan. Well, thank you very much, Flavio. I appreciate it. Thank you for your, for your remarks. And I'd like to begin by thanking um, the Border Trade Alliance for allowing me the, the opportunity to participate participate in this great uh, panel. I've, I've been taking a lot of notes from what both of my uh, colleagues here have been saying, and especially, obviously, Noe Garcia, the president of the BTA, and, and Jesse Herford. For, uh, my name is uh, Ivan Jaime, um, Ivan Jaime, and we're not missing last names. That is my last name, and that's a question that I get. You know, I saw my name tag, and there's only two little names there, and uh, so a lot of people think that it's like Juan Jose or, you know, uh, JJ. No, that, that's my name. That's my whole name. And I, I, you know, used to get mad at my dad and say, why didn't you give me a middle name so that my name, he's like, because you already have two. If I give you one more, it's kind of silly. Long, you know, so <laughs> Long names don't help either. Eh? That's, <laughs> very <true. laughs> That's very true. Okay, well, um, what I would like to, you know, talk about today or, or the perspective that I'd like to leave everyone with today is, is really the intersection of private industry and government and uh, just 
provide some insights that I've gleaned, that I've been able to glean working for a company that's been in business for 152 years. Uh, Union Pacific, I think, is the third um, oldest company still using the same name, still in business. I think we're just behind General Electric and one other, uh, founded by Abraham Lincoln in 1862. Uh, we operate in, in 23 states west of the Mississippi, and uh, we have 50,000 employees, 33,000 miles of track about $25 billion in revenue. So it's a very, very large company. Uh, but really the, the big theme that I'd like to leave you away with is it's a, it's a business that's healthy, it's a business that's investing. And there's a lot of uh, factors that could uh, affect that for the better or for the worse. And so um, I think that's where these events are just so helpful because it's sometimes very um, interesting to see how a company makes decisions to invest uh, their, their capital, their, their, um, the capital that they could otherwise return to their stakeholders or that they could return to their employees. And when they're looking at investing in a region like the border, like Laredo or in Eagle Pass with my uh, good friend Hector Serna, is um, how much certainty is there? And, and oftentimes the business is there, and I think you'll see after I'm done with my remarks, the business is there. It's just the uncertainty that sometimes leads them to say, um, you know, why would we invest in an area where we don't know if we're going to get this done in 12, 24, 36 months? Uh, so let's take the money elsewhere. So I, I think that's a big theme that I would like to, to do is to make, make it easy for people to invest in our region and create jobs in our, in our area. And I just realized I don't have the clicker. Um, but uh, if we can start handing it down, Flavio, if you wouldn't mind, Aista. Yeah, and I'll start in the in the process. You know, one last thing that I'll that I'll say in the opening remarks is that I grew up in Brownsville, and it's so interesting to me to be here. And you know, sometimes I consider Jesse and, and knowing my my uh, kind of in the same group, um, getting involved. And uh, I remember growing up in Brownsville and going to the to the mall to um, uh, Miguel Land Mall. And uh, I just remember that if you didn't make it through, the train would be there just blocking you for about two hours. And and I didn't really know what was going on. You know, I just remember that it was a pain and there was no way to get around. And, you know, the guys were working. You know, you'd get mad at the guys that, you know, that they were working. And so later on I started, and then the train went away, you know, and it moved away out of town. And, you know, but then you still had the train blocking and um, less, but still there. And now there's a plan to move it. And it's really cool to come and see, you know, this is David Garcia's here and, of course, Com uh, Commissioner Sanchez from Brownsville. And it's really cool to see all the people making these things move from a perspective of growing up and seeing it and living it. And and kind of being in the room where people are trying to do something about it, just something that I find really interesting and really exciting. Um, so again, I already talked a little bit about this. Uh, last few things that I'll mention here is uh, you'll see we have an estimated 45 to 60 trains crossing the border at any of our six rail ports of entry on a given day. Uh, each train is the equivalent to give you an idea of 300 freight trucks. So if you take a, a rather busy day of 60 trains a day, uh, it's the equivalent of 18,000 freight trucks moving north. So you, um, uh, those of us that have experienced moving across a border, and if you're waiting at the, at the bridge in uh, Juarez, waiting to cross into El Paso, or in, La, in Nuevo Laredo, waiting to cross into uh, Laredo, imagine about another 5,000 trucks there, uh, how much longer it would take you to come in. So that's a real big play of being able to convert a lot of that traffic. Uh, uh, Diputado Murguia yesterday mentioned, he said, you know, we, we can't continue uh, to grow uh, to, for our infrastructure to keep up with those uh, trucks, and the trucks are, are doing great as well, but there's got to also be a rail component uh, in there as well. We have about uh, 1,000 employees uh, on the border. Um, again, that's really what I care about uh, is, is the jobs. How do we create more jobs? Uh, the average pay of a, a railroad employee is $100,000. Uh, unionized, 90% of our workforce is unionized. So once you get a job with a railroad, um, you, you're going to be there for a long time. So I think those are the type of jobs that we want to create. Uh, I love going after Alex. We presented on several panels together because he usually talks about all the projects and shows maps on where those projects are. And you look at the rail lines, and that's where they're going through. And many reasons why those projects are happening there is because there's rail lines going through those areas. So uh, you see what we carry is we carry just about anything, all the raw materials going into the plants, all the finished goods coming north. Uh, and then the challenge is really that, again, is, is that uncertainty. So I'll give you another example here. Um, I was discussing with Hector, for example, in Eagle Pass, uh, we're just growing tremendously. And it's been about a five-year growth where we have grown from about 300 rail cars in a 24-hour period to about 1,200 rail cars. Uh, in a 24-hour period. We've doubled our workforce. We've invested, you'll see here, a little bit um, over 40, $45 million in the area. Uh, but one of the challenges that we have is the federal agencies, they're hardworking people, but sometimes it's very difficult to have them react as rapidly as the market needs them to react. So uh, by the time that they react, you're already constrained. You've already lost some businesses. Uh, your, uh, your customers already have suffered. And those costs that we discussed, Flavia, at the beginning of how do we get those costs down for the customers, by that point, their supply chain is already very costly. So this is just another representation um, 
About 75% of uh, rail traffic on Union Pacific moves through Eagle Pass and Laredo. And just the primary reason for that is the most direct route into where all the production is going on in Monterrey and, and uh, Aguascalientes and, and uh, Mexico City. So it's uh, um, about 75% going through those two ports. Nogales is experiencing tremendous growth in the agricultural sector. Um, uh, Agustin was mentioning earlier how, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to have a perspective border-wide. So if you just follow the railroad, just set up a Google alert, you'll kind of see where all these projects are, are moving, and it gives you a really wide uh, perspective of what's going on um, in El Paso. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about El Paso in one of the next slides. So we talk about investment. So again, this is kind of uh, m where my involvement comes in with Union Pacific. I wish I made the decisions uh, on where to invest these hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't. But usually when that decision is made, I'm usually uh, put on my hard hat and go try to make sure that we get everything, all the permits, everything that's needed. So I would imagine that any region would want investments of $100 million, $200 million, $250 million. So just to show you, in the last 10 years, um, and I, I didn't add the, the line for 2013, but if you include the last 10 years from 2004 to 2013, on border what we call subdivisions, and we call rail lines going into an area a subdivision. So rail lines going in and out of the border, uh, we've invested $320 million of Union Pacific private funding, and that is not including the one that I'm going to show you right now. So it's just a tremendous amount of investment. There's a lot of growth, uh, a lot more possible if we're all on the same page. And if, um, as, as Flavio was mentioning, if it's the dream of the exporter, or somebody mentioned the dream of the exporter is no red tape, right? So how do we continue to work on that red tape? Okay, so now I'll show you the crown jewel of Union Pacific right now is our Santa Teresa terminal. It's a Santa Teresa is a, a rural area outside of El Paso, about 13 miles, I believe. Um, we just opened a terminal that we finished one year in advance. $400 million investment by Union Pacific uh, in the ground. As you see there, it's 12 miles long, almost two miles wide. Uh, we just had the grand opening, and one of my colleagues said, you know, I could actually run a half a marathon from one end of the yard to the other. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's just a, a, a picture of how to, how to just think about how big it is. Uh, it's an intermodal ramp. So what is an intermodal ramp? And, and again, I think this is where the trucking partners come in as well, is uh, it's the ability to have cranes at a location uh, to be able to transfer containers from all modes of transportation. So if you have uh, freight coming from China, that needs to go through the port of Los Angeles, but needs to eventually go into Monterrey for assembly and then come back to Chicago, you, never, you don't have to transfer con uh, product from one container to the other. It basically comes on one container from Asia on, on a ship. It onboards in, in LA, for example. The same container gets placed by cranes on a train. It comes into Santa Teresa. Um, the intermodal, there's more cranes there, take the container off, put it on a truck, it goes into Chihuahua City to wherever it needs to go, comes back, gets back on the train, goes to the Port of Houston or to Chicago for further uh, handling. It's just very effective. It's, it allows shippers and manufacturers, if you're Toyota, General Motors, any type of big shippers, Aceros in Mexico, and you're shipping large quantities, it allows you the flexibility to really have a lot of options in your supply chain uh, to be able to use the least effective or the least uh, uh, costly option for as long as possible. Uh, in Santa Teresa, we have a capacity for 225,000 lifts. So that means we can process 225,000 containers on a yearly basis. Uh, we were expecting to handle 12,000 containers. So that's 12,000 trucks going in and out of that facility on, uh, on a monthly basis. We were expecting 12,000. We're actually handling 15,000 containers. So we're on pace to do 180,000 already. We're already looking at expanding this facility. The great thing about this, though, is you look at here, and we can grow anywhere we want here. <laughs> it's a greenfield. You can see we're not going to be bothering. I'm not going to be getting phone calls about the train horn keeping anybody up at night here, I don't think. <laughs> uh, so um, so that's, that's something that's exciting to us. As you can see, what we do there is we fuel our locomotives. This is like a big pit stop for trains coming from Los Angeles, trying to get to Chicago or New York City, Atlanta, Houston, as fast as possible. Uh, we process about 200 locomotives daily. Each locomotive takes in 5,000 gallons of fuel. Um, and we, uh, as you can see, we inspect about 5,000 rail cars daily, and we change crews. So just by opening this facility immediately, we created 300 jobs on the railroad. Uh, we're thinking it'll grow to 600 by 2020. That's not including the truck drivers that bring in the containers, the warehousing employees that work in the warehouses. So it's a, it's a key, and, and I hope that this gives you, when the Border Trade Alliance helps me set up, set up those meetings about why we need more customs agents, more USDA, more Shagarpa, uh, on both sides of the border, more agents that we need 
I, it just it's hard to fathom sometimes why the answer isn't they'll be there tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ivan. Well, well, I suppose that we are pretty much on time. It seems like uh, we in the, in the business of infrastructure do meet our timing, so it means <laughs> that, uh, that you deliver on time. Uh, Alex, uh, a great uh, thanks for your contribution. I think we will help you through the representation of the, of the people here. I'm uh, counting in, on it. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you all for uh, having us, and I hope that uh, it gives you a flavor of the need to have a better working relationship in an area that can become soon the area which is the most that will represent the most growth in the world and uh, the most uh, productive and competitive so uh, with this on the floor i think that we go to the next uh, uh, we have a small break and then we go to uh, to the next uh, uh, panel thank you